Well, our thanks as always to Home Street Bank for their support of this podcast. If if you're looking for a bank that has it all, great people, great service, great rates, this is the place for you. This is my letter of choice. It should be yours as well. Go to homestreetbank.com. It's your one-stop shop for all your banking needs, both business and personal. That's homestreetbank.com. We know what we think our brand is about, but there is only one opinion that really matters. What does your customer think about your company's brand? And what do they think of the personal brand of the salesperson? That's a lot to unpack on today's episode of The Buyer's Mind. Welcome to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a closer look deep inside your customer's decision-making mechanism to reverse engineer the perfect sales presentation. Now, please welcome your host, Jeff Shaw. Well, welcome everyone once again to The Buyer's Mind, where we take a look inside our customer's decision-making mechanism, try and figure out what's going on inside their brain. We approach this from the idea that if you understand your customer well enough, if you know the way that they want to buy, you can reverse engineer your sales presentation to make it easy for them to do that. I'm joined, as always, by our show producer, Paul Murphy. Hey, Murph, today we're going to talk about internal alignment and brand integrity and leakage and brands as heuristics. Uh, what do you think? Are you ready to have your brain expanded just a bit? I am, but I'm concerned about the term brand leakage. Uh, do, I, <laughs> do I need to go get uh, my depends on before we start our episode today? Uh, yeah, I know, really. That uh, could get a little bit uh, difficult here. Well, Murph, you were just recently introduced to a specific brand called in and out Burgers. Well, what is your brand perception? I mean, when you think of that chain, what comes to mind? Simplicity. You know, simplicity of the menu, um, and then just straight up, it's a burger. It's it's exactly what I'm looking for, and uh, it's tasty stuff. There you go. There you go. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, let me give you the quote of the day from a, a true marketing guru and a good friend of mine, Jay Bear. He says, branding is the art of aligning what you want people to think about your company with what people actually think about your company and vice versa. Branding is about reality, and there's only one brand that really matters. That's the brand that the customer carries in her mind. And that's true both for a corporate brand and an individual brand. We might think that we've got this brand that we carry around, but it's all about brand perception. And the best companies do such a great job of aligning what we want people to think and what people actually think. So that leads us to our our tip of the day for you sales professionals out there. I want to encourage you to adopt something in the company's stated brand and bring it to life. Okay? What can you do to promote the brand in a purposeful way? If your brand statement suggests, if your company's brand statement suggests that there is a personalized care for each and every customer, great. What does that look like in practice? And I want to give you one other thought on this, too, as it relates to brand. A huge part of branding is likability. It traces back to likability. We really appreciate brands if we like that company and if the brand gives us a sense of likability. But that's true with a personal brand as well. So if you're a salesperson, I want to just suggest you right now, uh, here's, a, here's a tip of the day. Be nice. And we talk about this from time to time, and it sounds a little pithy and, and almost childish, but the fact of the matter is that when I go out of my way to be nice to people, then I am deemed to be likable. And when I am likable, I am deemed to be trustworthy. So if you really want to carry the brand forward, I think the brand of likability is absolutely critical to how we can promote what we're trying to do in a very healthy way and have a brand identity that is consistent. That is, that the brand that I want my customer to carry is, in fact, the brand that they have in their mind. All right, well, I'm thrilled to welcome to the buyer's mind a speaker, author, guru on branding, Steve McKee. He's the president of McKee Walwork & Company. He writes for Business Week, the author of several books, including Power Branding. We're going to talk about that today. Joining us from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Steve McKee. Steve, how are you? I'm very well. Delighted to be here. Thrilled to have you here. Uh, this is such an interesting topic, and it fits sort of right into uh, our focus point on the buyer's mind, because the buyer's mind is very much affected by branding. It's just that it's affected in ways that we don't 
normally understand, right? We, we don't sit around as consumers and go, hmm, what is the brand and what does it speak to me? And yet it's still a very real thing, right? It's an absolutely real thing. In fact, it's it's a, a relationship with a brand is not unlike a relationship with a human being. Mm -hmm. And I put certain qualifications on that because obviously it's not as meaningful, mm -hmm. but a lot of the same principles apply. Tell me, give it, elaborate on that. How, how would that be? Because that's a very provocative statement. Elaborate on that. Well, uh, a, a brand is a shortcut, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there's a lot of ways to define a brand, but when you're in, in, a, in the buyer's mind, when they hear a brand name or see a brand logo, it's a shortcut that's imbued with meaning. Much like when they hear a person's name or see a person, they have certain uh, um, attributes that come to mind. Mm -hmm. But things like affection and trust and uh, reliability, all those sorts of things that you would think about a person, can I trust this person? Do I like this person? Those are the same sort of emotions we have with relationship to brands. Again, not as strongly, um, but it's but it's how we're made. But but it, it's uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth here. But you're you're suggesting that a brand is something of a heuristic. It's a it, it, it's this um, uh, this mental shortcut that allows me to associate what I believe or perceive about a brand and then ascribe to it a, a degree of uh, trust or dislike or anything else. It, it, did I oversimplify that? No, it is, it is exactly that. It's a heuristic. It's mm -hmm. a shortcut. But the way you described it was that I, as a consumer, and I know you didn't mean this, but like do the work of associating these things, but it really just happens, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's what a shortcut is all about. You just, when, when you're exposed to a logo or an image of a brand, unless it's an unknown brand, you immediately have a, a rational and non-rational reaction to mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. for good or for ill. Right. Uh, do you subscribe to the idea that there is always a brand that a consumer is going to carry? It just may not at all be the brand that the organization would wish that they carry. And that is the art of branding. You're absolutely right. Because a brand exists in the mind of the consumer. That's where it lives. All a company can do is try to shape and form and mold what people think and feel about them. But the brand actually exists in the buyer's mind. It's true. Which is why we see so much conflict out there. I, I doubt right now, I hate to pick on them. Actually, I don't mind picking on them at all. But I, I doubt very much that the brand identity that is held by the CEO of United Airlines is consistent with the brand identity of most of the people who travel for a living. United Airlines, Uber, mm -hmm. uh, Chipotle, yeah. uh, you name it. It's yeah. because stuff happens. And sometimes it's within the company's control and sometimes it's not. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so much has been written about branding and what we always, typically what we do wrong and what just seemingly just a few companies do right. How have we not figured out how to get our brand strategy correct? Or, or is it simply that we're allowing our brand strategy to just evolve without really marshalling it along? Well, it's it's one. It's difficult. It's very difficult to do because there, there. Um, as we like to say, that the business and the brand are inextricably intertwined, meaning there isn't anything that the business does or says that doesn't affect its brand. So it's very, very complicated. First of all, but secondly, I also think that historically branding has been sort of thought of in a light lightweight sense. And so, if you think about the the topic of branding in a boardroom, they kind of think it's sort of lightweight, but it, if you exchange the word reputation for branding, your corporate reputation, it takes on a little bit different light and it's really the same thing. So part of it is the short shrift it gets at the top of the organization and then part of it is just plain hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a really interesting insight about exchanging the word branding for reputation. And that seems to me the type of thing that would get the attention of uh, you know the board of directors if we're looking at our reputation versus just uh, our brand. How does that brand carry down then into the frontline experience between a consumer and an organization with a with a sales representative with the retail clerk uh how does that brand carry through when does that work when does it not work it it never works completely N not ever because there's it's like a game of telephone right or it's like we, we, we like to quote, we're not scientists, but the second law of thermodynamics, which is entropy, everything in the universe tends towards disarray. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a helpful way to think about it because then what's my role as a brand steward, my role is to be gravity, try and hold things together. But 
a brand, um, we've done a lot of research into the internal dynamics that, that uh, get and keep companies down. And the number one factor that we find the most um, destructive and the most sinister because it often goes unrecognized is a lack of internal alignment. And if you want to think about that around the around a brand, there is a brand standard, which is written about in the brand manual. And that's where, you know, it's sort of the North Star that's meant to guide the organization. Mm -hmm. But at every level of the organization, there's a, there's there's a leak, right? Just because we're all humans. And sometimes the leak can get really, really bad. So, for instance, you take a Wells Fargo and the stuff that they've gone through recently. I mean, literally counter brand action activities have taken place, right? Mm -hmm. uh, illegal activities have taken place. Mm -hmm. But even without that, you know, Wells Fargo can have the best intent, and I'm not picking on them, but they can right. have the best intentions in the world in the, in the boardroom. And yet when it gets down to the individual teller in an individual branch location, you know, there's a lot of other things that are going to impact the customer experience there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's an interesting concept. The idea that at every level there is a leak and you get move, you move farther and farther away from the desired brand. But what you get closer and closer to is the real brand, because ultimately the only brand that really matters is whatever the consumer carries around in, in his or her head. Right. That's why. Yeah. That's why one of my power branding principles is your most important target audience are the people who have your brand on their business cards mm -hmm. or their name tags, as it were. Right. They're the most important people to reach because they're the ones, we're all publishers today. Every consumer is a publisher. And that's why it's critical that a company has internal alignment. That's the, before they buy a television spot or put a piece of sales collateral out in the marketplace, internal alignment is priority one. Uh, who has really good brand alignment? G give us an idea of a company. It's never going to be perfect. Uh, at at yeah. least that's what I hear you saying. But give us the, uh, an example of a company where the brand that is identified at the very top level of the organization uh, is carried through most consistently in the consumer experience. The, the, the best example I can provide of that, I think, would be Southwest Airlines historically. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with the inspirational antics of Herb Kelleher, its yeah. founder. Mm -hmm. But if you think about Southwest Airlines and, you know, all the way down to the, the, the flight attendants, the way they do the safety briefing, which other airlines have started to mimic now, mm -hmm. right. um, to the fact that they offered peanuts, which their competitors thought was a strike against the brand and they didn't realize, you know, that's actually a feature mm -hmm. of the brand. Mm -hmm. Southwest Airlines still to this day, to some extent has a great spirit about it. And the way I like to describe it is the difference between Southwest and other airlines is every time you fly stuff goes wrong, but the people at Southwest try, that's the way I describe it. Mm -hmm. They try to make things right. Whereas the other airlines don't. Mm -hmm. um, Starbucks might be another example that's done a pretty good job of that getting the the ethos of the brand down into the stores mm -hmm. um uh and you know historically you've got uh, uh nordstrom mm -hmm. um uh maybe even walmart uh at least when sam walton was alive mm -hmm. Uh, in a different context, but it's yeah. difficult to do. Yeah. It's difficult to do. Right. Well, there's so many moving parts. And when, if you look at, you say at every level, there's a leak. When you have these mega organizations, that's a lot of levels and therefore a lot of leaks. And you could really get that sense that it, it seems to me that the, that the personality of the leadership and how much they allow their personality to uh, direct the brand is going to make a huge difference. So I'm a huge fan of Herb Keller, and you could just sort of see him trickle down to this day as part of his legacy. And, and yeah, they, I mean, it's great because Southwest has fun with it, right? It, when they were accused of being a no frills airlines, they actually took their packets of peanuts and wrote the word frills on it. So here, yeah, you want exactly. frills? We got frills. They're right here. They're called peanuts. So it's a, a a great way to look at it, uh, but it's. I, I just think with Southwest, they're just so much more aware than every other company about the way that the brand carries through in its execution, right? And that's, yeah, and that's a function of a word that I'm fond of using in this context is empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, so we're sort of back to the humanity of it. What, is, what do you mean empathy? A brand, a company that has empathy for the people it serves, which implies knowledge of, but also understanding of, and maybe even um, interest in uh, the, you know, why do they do, why did somebody one day do a funny safety briefing? And I don't know exactly how it came about, but I'll bet you somebody just did it 
on the airline because the cut, the, the passengers needed it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Cause you watch us walk on the plane and we're just dour and sour and we're getting ready to cram into the small. So somebody said, I'm going to brighten their day. I'm gonna do the safety briefing in poetry form or what have you. Right. And now it's become a thing. Right. And they had the permission to do that because of within the con the context of what the Southwest brand was, they felt free to do that. And see, that's how you overcome the leakage mm-hmm. is you have people understand what the brand genuinely is, and then they can interpret it in different situations mm-hmm. instead of looking to, so that's what happened with United, right? They, they looked right. to the manual, if you will, they followed procedures, but you can't come up with a procedure for what happened on that awful flight from wherever it was, Chicago to Louisville. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, but so in when, this case, though, you're, you're, you're talking about the brand as sort of a, um, how do we describe it, an ethos of the company. It's the, it's the zeitgeist of what goes on more than here is the stated brand identity as has been handed down by the CEO or the marketing department. Well, and that's where, I mean, that's what it should be. It should mm-hmm. be the ethos of the company. And most most small companies or startups or, or first-generation founder-led companies, it is. Mm-hmm. It's one and the same. Mm-hmm. You take a, and that's, see, that's the trick. What Southwest Airlines has been able to do is past Herb Kelleher's tenure, they've been able to hold on to that to a great extent. I worry for Starbucks mm-hmm. because Howard Schultz is that guy. Yeah. And he left once and mm-hmm. things started to loosen up and he mm-hmm. came back. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to, well, let me just put it this way. We don't know mm-hmm. if they're going to be able to maintain that ethos when the figurehead is retired. Right. Right. Uh, again, a, a huge credit then to Southwest for being able to do that. You talk about the consumer mind being, and this is, I, I believe this is your direct quote, rationally non-rational. Yep. Can you elaborate on that, please? Sure. Um there, there's a principle we call the fallacy of rationality, which is what a lot of marketers believe, which is if you present your case to your consumer and it's airtight, they're going to agree with your conclusion. Mm-hmm. That's just not the case because so much of our decision-making is non-rational. And, and I'm glad you use that word because irrational sort of is a pejorative term. Mm-hmm. So much of how we make our decisions is based on subconscious gut level feeling uh, back of the mind stuff that we can't even process yet. And science is just beginning to admit that we know precious little about how the human ri- mind really works. So when you see articles, uh, headlines in the Harvard Business Review of an article that says, when to trust your gut, and it's serious science-based conversation about what that is when you have that feeling in your gut, uh, that's a very real deal. But if you examine, uh, examine your own decision-making in the consumer marketplace, I, I would defy anybody to tell me one decision that they made that was completely rational. Mm-hmm. Right. Just is not the way we work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we certainly, I mean, in, uh, in episode ep- after episode, we've talked about this on the buyer's mind, the concept of non-rationality or maybe it's perceived rationality. <laughs> we think we're being rational. We're huge fans of Daniel Kahneman here on the show. And and uh, this is one of his, his uh, key points is that we live under the illusion that we know ourselves and we really, really don't. All right. So if you don't really know yourself, if the, the fact of the matter is that you are rationally non-rational, then how do you approach this as somebody who is a brand strategist, a, a yes. marketer? Marketing expert, how do you encourage your clients then to approach somebody who is rationally non-rational? Yeah, well, it's a it's a it's a difficult task. But mm-hmm. w- one of the things we have to do is is first of all throw out most market research <laughs> because most market research is predicated on the fact that consumers understand themselves. Mm-hmm. If, you know, if you ask me why did you buy this thing or what interests you, what attributes do you, most people can't. So we we we're the biggest proponents of market research that I know, but we do it differently. We go about trying to understand, we, we, we never try to go in the front door. We're always trying to sneak in through a window of, of, the, of the consumer's psyche. And we've developed a number of, of tactics and techniques to do that. But it's all driven by this understanding that um, people aren't just prospects, they're people and they're fully orbed people. And they've got, uh, we, we, we pioneered a new form of re- research that we call ideals research and ideal stands for interest, desires, emotions, attitudes, and lifestyles segmentation. That's what we're looking for. You know, the seat of their emotions, the, their, their perceptions, their biases, those sorts of things. And you have to, 
you have to approach it with a real open mind if uh, versus looking for a consumer, you know, or as one of my uh, former employees said, you can't ask the deer how to hunt it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not going to tell you. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I love the uh, uh, the, the uh, Henry Ford quote. If I asked people what they wanted, they would say they want faster horses. Yeah, uh, exactly. And uh, uh, And that's that's what we do so often yeah yeah it's a very steve jobs of you uh to be able to think in that way um i know that uh you're passionate about the subject of uh discounting uh, passionate as in heartburn like uh can you talk about the effect of discounting on brand perception yeah it's it's destructive it's always destructive sometimes you need to discount for a tactical reason but anytime you offer a discount, you're telling people that your product or service is not worth its price. That's what you're doing. So you're, by definition, destroying brand value. That's different from being a low price leader where your everyday low prices are low. That's completely different. But when you set the price up here and, you, and then you mark it down for whatever reason, you are, by definition, telling people that you believe your product is not worth the price. And that's why it's destructive of brand equity. Okay, so what is it then that causes people to be so enamored with what they perceive to be that great sale? So, you know, I look at it and I'll, 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 there's a brand of, of uh, dress shirts, um, uh, men's dress shirts. Uh, it's, it's called Bugatti. And uh, if you're going to buy a Bugatti shirt at a Nordstrom, it's going to cost you 160 170 bucks, right? It's an upper end um, uh, shirt. But you know, not far from where I live, we have a, a store called Off Fifth. It's the Saks Fifth Avenue brand uh, store, but it's their, obviously, it's their version of Nordstrom Rack. And I saw a Bugatti shirt there recently, uh, and it was, I bought it for, I think, I don't know, $29. And I walked away feeling like, oh, I got a great deal. And yet there's yeah. something quirky deep down inside that's like, this is not like my other Bugatti shirts. Well, and you, you just proved the point. See, the reason you believed it was a great deal was because you got it for less than you felt the brand was worth. Mm-hmm. If you continue to buy it at that price, the worth of that brand will be re reestablished in your mind at a lower level. Mm-hmm. Years ago, Burger King started offering their Whoppers for 99 cents on a promotion, and they extended the promotion, and they extended the promotion, they extended the promotion to where nobody would pay more than 99 cents for a Whopper. Mm-hmm. Coach did it. Coach, the leather goods store. They started opening all these outlet mall locations and selling. Now, what are they doing? They're ch- changing the name mm-hmm. because they destroyed the value of the brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's funny how how we see this, and of course, we deal so much with frontline sales professionals who are constantly thinking, "I I need a sale, I need a discount," and I'm I'm constantly trying to jump into the fray to say this is the last thing uh, that you need because I, I, I do think that it immediately uh, causes that what's wrong. And even as I'm picturing myself back at that uh, off fifth uh, store, uh, I'm looking at that shirt and I'm thinking, is one sleeve longer than the other? <laughs> is there a mustard stain on this somewhere? But there is a, a devaluing that uh, takes place. There's no question about it. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I would just say sometimes the fashion brands like you're talking about, they can get away with it a little bit by saying it's last year's model. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think they fudge that also. Sure. Yeah. Uh, we're just about out of time. Who are some of your favorite uh, marketing, sales and marketing thinkers out there today? You know, I, this is going to sound a little bit unusual, but um, uh, Patrick Lencioni, mm-hmm. who is not a sales and marketing guy, right. is one of my favorite sales and marketing thinkers mm-hmm. because his you're obviously familiar with him sure uh i'm a big fan of his and i'll promote him anywhere i go because he this concept of empathy Mm -hmm. and of organizational alignment and Mm -hmm. consistency and organizational health is what his stock and trade is Mm -hmm. and uh if one of the things he says and this is great for a salesperson he says when you meet a prospect start working for them don't wait till they hire you don't wait to get paid start meeting their needs and sometimes you'll get hired and sometimes you won't but that's you don't have to sell to them just start serving them and that's a great uh, uh way to build brand equity if you mm-hmm. want to bring it back to where we started uh h- how do you look at personal brand as independent of a corporate or an organizational brand and, and how do these two things mesh together i think it's really dangerous and i'm glad you asked me that question because nobody's talking about this we all have a personal brand meaning we all have a reputation so we always have mm-hmm. People who are preoccupied with their personal brand 
are going to subvert the organization. I, I really believe strongly that this whole uh, focus on personal branding of late is actually destructive hmm. because it, it causes us to start to selfishly focus on, on ourselves at the expense of our company or our clients. So don't hear what I'm not saying. It's important to be cognizant of the fact that you have a reputation, you have mm-hmm. a personal brand and you wanna manage it, meaning mm-hmm. you don't wanna do anything unethical and you wanna be thought of in a certain way. But I think we elevate our personal brands to a level that hurts us a lot in the long run. Mm-hmm. Hurts us as salespeople or hurts the organization? Uh, ultimately hurts us mm-hmm. because the more we focus on ourselves, the less satisfied we're going to be. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you. I'll tell you one area where I see that happen. It's the salesperson who is asked by a customer to uh, for a, 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 you know, a lower price or a discount or whatever it is, and they come back to the customer and say, "Listen, if it was up to me, I'd say yes, but my unreasonable manager is having a bad day, and she said no. So what are you going to do?" And I yeah. look at that and I go, "You are just destroying every ounce of credibility that you think you had before this conversation." And you don't realize that um, you'll be in a different job some other day. So will your boss. So will your client. And they'll, everybody will remember what you did. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, let's close with two pieces of advice. First, to frontline salespeople about their role in branding, and then uh, to executives about their role in branding. Frontline salespeople, I think my, my biggest advice would be don't sell. And, and that may not be new, but don't sell, serve, relate, have empathy, um, one of the things we learned in, in research in advertising is the greatest predictor of success in advertising is likability, mm-hmm. that actually research is showing that. We've always known that that's true in the sales process. Mm-hmm. So um, relate, have empathy. And in the executive suite, uh, boy, uh, take it seriously. Your brand, unlike any other asset the organization owns, it's the only asset that need never depreciate. Think about that. <laughs> buildings, buildings crumble, roofs leak, trucks, mm-hmm. right? Intellectual property expires. Your brand can appreciate forever, which makes it fundamentally your most valuable asset. Think of it that way. Love it. Love it. Uh, Steve McKee is his name. Absolutely a brilliant insight. Uh, the book is called Power Branding. You can learn more about Steve at McKee wallwork.com and we'll put that in the show notes uh, right here steve i can't thank you enough a fascinating conversation thanks for being on the show thanks jeff it was fun uh well murph i i, I like that guy i i love taking a topic like branding and making it just so incredibly approachable that was a fun conversation well, it was exciting because you were throwing him some curveballs there, and I was impressed <laughs> with the way he handled it. Yeah, he's uh, he's uh, clearly a smart guy. He's uh, he's thought about these things uh, quite a bit. Uh, a couple of things that really really popped out here. I love the idea that that concept of uh, brands moving from order to disorder. Everything tends towards disarray, and that every level of organization there is that leak uh, where we see the internal alignment start to split apart a little bit. And by the time you're done, the person you're talking to on the front line uh, is carrying a very different version of the brand than what would have come out from the marketing department. That was interesting stuff. Well, playing telephone always weakens everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going down the line. But did you check to find out what the story was at the back end? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, that's a it's a great analogy too because that's exactly what happens, right? The uh, that 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 playing telephone side of things comes along. And then there's the idea of the fallacy of rationality. I love the way that he framed this. Of course, this is something that we've talked about uh, quite a bit in the past, the idea that uh, oftentimes uh, uh, consumers believe that they are rational, but he, he just had such a uh, down-to-earth uh, take on it. Uh, I, I love, too, the idea of uh, personal brand. He had a real negative reaction about personal brand. Did that surprise you? It did. Uh, I was a little surprised, but I also liked where he went with it. I I thought that whole idea of if you put yourself ahead of your company, you'll destroy not only yourself, but the company as well. 
Yeah, right. That people who carry that personal brand too loudly end up uh, disrupting and then damaging their reputation, both their reputation and the company's reputation. I thought that that was really, really important. And I've certainly seen that happen where you see a salesperson who is unquestionably a great salesperson in the sense that they were very effective at getting the sale. They do a good job, but they are their own brand and they find themselves somewhat disconnected from the organization. And it leads to a, a, a real disconnect in the in the customer's mind, whose side are you on, right? Is who are you and uh, who do you represent? So that's always a, a very, very interesting challenge. Um, I, I really enjoy that conversation. And I, I think that it's an important, it fits so well into what we talk about here on The Buyer's Mind, that the brand is, in fact, this heuristic, this decision-making shortcut that a customer carries along with them. And I think that if you're a frontline sales and marketing practitioner, you have to understand that you do your customer no favors at all when your version of our brand is inconsistent with the company's version of the brand. And that, in fact, you carry the standard of the brand, not just for your company, but for your customer. So we want to think about it by the time we're done, and we've talked about this many times on the buyer's mind, keep it simple. In the consumer's mind, easy equals right. So when there's a conflict between the brand of the organization and your own brand, it's always going to get you into trouble. This is a very important thing that we do here because when you think of the consumer and of the customer, they associate the brand with a degree of trust. And we know that that trust and that likability is so very important to help us in our decision-making process. So if I'm a customer and I don't trust the brand, brand or I don't like the brand, it makes it almost impossible for me to pull the trigger and to say yes. But if there's a level of trust and a level of likability that comes to me through the sales representative on behalf of the organization, and I can sense that alignment, I want to do business with that company. I want to be a part of that journey. So I just want to encourage you, uh, sales professionals, think this through. How do you carry that brand identity and how do you make sure that there is not that leak uh, and, and that lack of alignment between what you represent and what your customer or what your organization represents? And again, don't do this for your manager. Don't do this for the marketing department. Don't do this for the owner of the company. And don't do it for you. Do it for the customer. Well, if you're enjoying The Buyer's Mind, we would really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the podcast and send the word out there as we continue to grow this and our audience gets larger and larger. Consider posting a link to the podcast on your social media page, too. It would mean a lot to us. But that's a wrap on this episode of The Buyer's Mind. Hope you enjoyed it. You can find everything you need at jeffshore.com. But until next time, go out there and change someone's world.